Yeah, so we'll jump to the next slide. It's kind of a timeline, but before we get into the timeline here, as, as <coughs> Jim was alluding to, you know, Amy, I, I don't know, there's, there is a lawsuit out there by business groups uh, trying to get this put on the back burner? Yeah, that's right. On October 19th, the National Association of Manufacturers, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and the Business Roundtable filed suit against the SEC requesting that the conflict mineral rules be either modified or set aside. Um, to date, the SEC has not voluntarily agreed to to stay the rules, and it's unclear whether they'll, they'll agree to do that in the future. Um, we have a near-term timetable that's been set where the procedural motions need to be in by November 21st, and dispositive motions need to be in by December 6th. So we're expecting that later this month, um, the, the petitioners will file a motion to try to stay the rules. And, you know, the SEC might have a policy that, you know, they're continuing to get sued whenever they're coming up with these rules. They might say, you know, we're not going to stay the rules every single time we get sued. So maybe from a policy standpoint, they'll still, you know, not, not agree to stay the rules. But maybe if they see that the judge really thinks there's an issue here, from a tactical standpoint, they might agree to stay just so that they don't irritate the judge unnecessarily. The, the one thing that I'll add to that, under Dodd-Frank, this is the fifth lawsuit the Chamber of Commerce has taken against either the SEC or the Commodities Future Trade Commission. A lot of the basis has been that the SEC or the CFTC has expanded its scope beyond what was mandated in Dodd-Frank, and they didn't do an appropriate cost-benefit analysis. I think with 1502 conflict minerals, they were mandated by Congress to actually write this rule, and it was delayed significantly as a result of that cost-benefit analysis, and perhaps could contribute to why the SEC has not stayed the rule yet if they're going to stay at all. Yeah, I mean, we don't know what the petitioners are going to argue, but it's expected that they would argue that the, the SEC didn't administratively adopt the rules correctly because their, their cost-benefit analysis was incomplete. But as you mentioned, I mean, they really stepped up their efforts um, in that area because of prior lawsuits, and the chairman even advertised how much time they spent on the cost-benefit analysis when they disclosed the rules. Yeah, I, I would just add that... Uh, you know, regardless of whatever the outcome of the lawsuit or whether the court decides to stay the rules, um, we're very much encouraging companies to go forward with implementation. Uh, several major electronics companies have been going, going forward with tracing and auditing their supply chains over the last couple of years and have made quite a lot of progress. Uh, and so we're really encouraging companies to, to take similar steps and join those initiatives. And we'll get into some of the steps um, uh, shortly, but, uh, you know, regardless of, you know, the technical aspects of any lawsuit, we would really hope that everyone, you know, contributes to the solution. And one thing that I'll add to putting aside 1502, you got the California Supply Chain Transparency Act of 2012 for human trafficking and slave trade. Maryland has its own law. Massachusetts and Rhode Island are putting through legislation. California has another rule around it. Vancouver, Pittsburgh have become conflict-free proclamations. We visited with members Pittsburgh? of Park. It's not even a state. Well, it's a city. <laughs> city. <laughs> they, um, we met, we visited with members of parliament in the EU a couple months ago. They're putting through their versions of 1502 and 1504 for all traded companies on European exchanges. Japan's got something out there. Australia's got a law. Canada's got two pieces of legislation going through parliament. It's sort of death by a thousand cuts or the big bang approach in trying to figure out what all this legislation is. And what you're seeing in Europe is perhaps similar to the WE initiative for electronic waste when that came out back in 2004. Uh, a lot of it is being promulgated through the capital markets around the world, and I think trying to understand all this legislation up front as part of your strategy and your philosophy might be useful to determine how many times a company may have to comply with this. Yeah, so, I mean, it really sounds like you got to stay apprised of the laws all over the place, so, you know, your in-house counsel is probably going to be extremely busy. Uh, I, I can admit that I've talked to some in-house counsels in the last month who really aren't up to speed on this. Uh, it's kind of, you know, hadn't hit their radar screen because they're focused on many other things. Uh, and, and it is gaining momentum with all the in-house counsel to make sure that they've got this well understood. You know, Bala, a lot of people got going early, as people had talked about, and there were, uh, before the rules were finalized, did they have to reshift everything they'd done or, or what they'd done? Is it still helpful? Uh, certainly. Again, let me back up a little bit and emphasize that complying with the SEC regulation is just one element of, of working to, uh, on this issue, right? So 18 months ago when I was working with an electronics components manufacturer, the rule was still a proposed rule. They had no idea when, you know, SEC would opine on it. But my client said, my problem is less that the SEC, what the SEC rule asks for. A bigger question is, 
my customers, the Intels, the Apples, and the Hewlett Packards of the world are breathing down my neck and asking me for my services. So I've got to respond to them first, and I'm, I'm less worried about the SEC's final rule. Uh, so, that's, so the customer pressure is one issue. Then there's also the issue of your public perception, right? Your, you know, what, what, what do your customers think of you? What do the NGOs think of you? Things like that. So a lot of companies, especially in the electronics industry, got started a long before the final rules, uh, final rule was issued. And the, the good news is the final rule uh, provided more clarification on some issues. I mean, they, they in, in some ways they de-scoped it, but the core part of it, which was around you know, the, the, the conflict minerals in your product is still intact. So if you started off early, you are in pretty good shape. Uh, there are a few quirks that we'll come to, come to later on around contract to manufacture and other issues. But I, I'm more worried about companies that have not done anything as of right now. Because if you started uh, six months, one year ago, you, you are in pretty good shape right now. OK. And Amy, again, the, the timeline, uh, calendar years, doesn't matter what your fiscal year is. Right, you're reporting on a calendar year basis. So the first period you'll report on is January 1 through December 31, 2013. And that report will be due on May 31st, 2014. And then subsequent years, it, all, it will always be due on May 31st. Jim, any uh, update on an auditing standard? It's when the SEC finalized and actually proposed the rule, they kicked it to the Government Accountability Office for determining whether or not they were to write new auditing standards. The GAO said they believe they have existing standards that are out there, which are yellow book performance audits or due diligence. A yellow book standard is generally for government audits of either national or state and local entities or any companies that have taken federal funds from the U.S. government would be required to have it. So right now, the auditing standards would be under government generally accepted auditing standards, so everyone from, it has to be government certified from a CPE perspective in order to do an audit of your conflict minerals report. Currently, right now, the AICPA created a task force. The AICPA is the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants to perhaps d determine whether or not incremental auditing guidance needs to be created. What Amy referred to before, a national or international standard, it really there's only one in the world. It's the OECD guidelines. And if you've had the pleasure of reading these guidelines, they're very principles-based. Also, as auditors have a hard time opining upon a principle, so we're looking perhaps for further guidance from the AICPA to put more rules in place. So I, I think that there is a final auditing standard out there. We're looking to see whether or not there's going to be further clarification. 